Good afternoon. My name is Zaina Subah. I'm from Kuwait. I have the pleasure of being part of the first batch of Meli Fellows. By day, I serve as the Undersecretary for the Ministry of State for Youth Affairs. And by night, I'm a film producer and social entrepreneur. Five years ago, I launched my Aspen project. It was a visual storytelling incubator called Adasa. The aim was to develop and support youth so that they may share their stories and also so that they may provide an alternative narrative to the stories that we see about the Arab world in the news today. I'm happy to report that since then, Adasa has been wholly adopted by the government of Kuwait and we've been able to support hundreds of thousands of youth projects, yes, hundreds of thousands of youth projects in different capacities. My pledge today is to expand on this platform and build a new digital platform, a media incubator, to encourage 72% of the Kuwaiti population below the age of 34 to partake in the business of original content production and in the process develop a creative economy in Kuwait and the Gulf region by 2022. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Nduati. I'm from Kenya, the fourth class of the African Leadership Initiative. Um, I pledge to create 10,000 jobs in East Africa through entrepreneurship mentorship and capital mobilization. I'm pleased to report we started this last year, we earned 1,600 jobs. My name is Heather Son. I'm from the second class of Africa Leadership Initiative. <laughs> from the second class of Africa Leadership Initiative South Africa. And I am Keith Berwick, a senior fellow of the Aspen Institute. <laughs> and our pledge is we will moderate the 10th anniversary of the Good Life Seminar in Stellenbosch, South Africa, for 25 AGLN Fellows in November 2018. To instill the principles of love, kindness, and compassion as fundamental markers of the good society. And I would remind you that this whole, this whole Aspen Global Leadership Network began in 1997 with a single class of 22 Henry Crown Fellows. And they will be celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've met every year since in September this year. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Reiling. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the fifth anniversary of the Resnick Aspen Action Forum. Lyndon Stewart, please stand. Thank you so much. Thanks to your lead gift, this wonderful convening will remain. This wonderful community will be coming together through 2030. An amazing gift. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Let me also thank just a few of the other sponsors who helped to make this event possible, if you allow me to do that. I'll begin with the John P. and Ann Welsh McNulty Foundation, who've tripled this year's support in honor of the 10th anniversary of the John P. McNulty Prize. <laughs> Anne McNulty. As many of you know, yesterday we had a series of deep dives, and one of them was called Leading Your Venture from Idea to Impact. And, and I think it went extremely well. And thank you for that. And those of you, uh, as you exit here, you should have gotten in your welcome pack already. They've produced an incredible compendium 
of 11 case studies of the capturing the very inspiring work of our John P. McNulty Prize laureates. Everybody from Patrick Aua from Ghana to Jordan Casalau to Amy Crockett to Bart Houlihan. And by the way, Bart's wife is running for office in Pennsylvania, so we got to do our best to support her. I want to thank David Rubenstein, who's not here with us today, but does support this gathering. And without him, there would be no China Fellowship Program. So we're extremely grateful for his support. I want to thank uh, representatives who are here from the Skoll Foundation with thanks for your long partnership with the Aspen Institute. Uh, Margo and Tom Pritzker, I want to thank you for all of your support and special thanks to you, Margo, as the chair of the leadership committee of our board of trustees. Um, a tireless supporter of everything that we do. I want to thank uh, Jillian and Bob Steele. I want to thank Michael Klein and Joan Fabry. I think Mike is somewhere out there. I want to thank my friend and mentor, Skip Battle. I'm not sure where Skip is sitting right now. There he is. And with apologies, I'm not going to go through the whole list, um, but you'll see everybody's names out on the banners and in the beautiful program book that we've put together for you. People are providing not just financial support, but I hope you'll take some time to look at the beautiful artwork, which is so integral to the work of the Aspen Institute. If you go out into the, the uh, lobby here, into the Murdoch uh, Lounge, you'll see some beautiful artwork contributed by the Africa Leadership Initiative in South Africa with thanks to A.D. Entoven and Ralph Fries. I hope you'll take some time to look at that. Uh, hopefully you'll get down to the Pitkin County Library if you can to take a look at this amazing exhibit um, called Working in America with thanks to Sonny Garg and to Margo as well um, for their support. And I think that uh, um, uh, it's a really important time to be looking at that uh, particular um, display. And uh, last, I want to just uh, thank uh, Aaron Huey. He was with us last year, produced those marvelous posters. And you've seen his poster art down at the gym where we've registered, and you can see his stuff all over campus. And of course, uh, I want to thank Lyndon Stewart, of course, because we have some beautiful artwork down in the, in the uh, lower level here of the Door Hosier building. And thank you for that. Speaking of artwork and powerful, uh, Jennifer Bray and Omar Wasal, where are you? I hope you're in the room. Uh, last night, we had a chance to view uh, a really remarkable film. I hope those of you who were um, around um, agree with me. This is one of the most incredible stories of not just pain, unfortunately, but also of intense courage and love and action and work last night. So I'm not sure if they're here, but even if they aren't, can we just have a round of applause? I purposely skipped over one of our sponsors, and that's Paul Hastings Law Firm. Uh, as many of you know, this is a global law firm that's provided pro bono support to a range of our fellows around the world, uh, two dozen of them at this point, from uh, Hong Kong to Australia, from Los Angeles to uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I'm delighted to share that we just got the news that uh, they've decided to more than double their pro bono support for our fellows from 200 to 500 hours. And they've also agreed to extend their support, and this is for fellows who have ventures that might need this, beyond legal services to include professional support in communications, marketing, finance, IT, HR, and so on. All 2,558 fellows, you can see the film is already outdated, 2,558 fellows in the Aspen Global Leadership Network are eligible for this support as well. So if you're looking for that, uh, do have a visit out to the Genius Bar, and you can sign up for a consult. So uh, I'd like to share a few remarks as we get started with the week, and I hope you'll bear with me. 52 years ago this week, Bob Dylan recorded Ballad of a Thin Man. It only took me three minutes to get his name in here. <laughs> Did I mention the Nobel Prize for Literature? Those of you who might know this song, Ballad of a Thin Man, knows it has a refrain to it. And the refrain is, you know something's happening here, but you don't quite know what it is. I think that sums up the world for me right now. I don't know about you, but I am feeling a little bit confused with the world right now. It wasn't that long ago, to me at least, and I'm speaking personally here, not as the Aspen Institute, that it seemed like the world was on a pretty positive track that ever larger areas all around the globe were on their way to realizing the so-called four freedoms. These freedoms were first described by Franklin Roosevelt 
in a State of the Union address he gave in 1941. Just this past spring, Darren Walker, who I think many of you know, he's the president of the Ford Foundation, but he's also the newest judge on the John P. McNulty Prize uh, jury. He revisited these four freedoms in a series of speeches that he gave across college campuses this past spring. These freedoms are the freedom of speech, the freedom of belief, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Now, I'm not naive. I couldn't know Aspen fellows like Silvia Herrera or Yuan Li and not recognize that freedom of speech still has a ways to go in places like Guatemala and places like China, maybe even my beloved Berkeley, California, too. I couldn't know Tim El Hadi or Shane Tejarati and not realize that freedom of belief is still under siege in places like Egypt and Iran, on trains in Portland, Oregon, as well. I couldn't know Ali Mufaruki or Manoj Kumar and not realize there's still a lot of people longing for freedom from want in places like Tanzania and India, in West Virginia and Mississippi as well. And I couldn't know Lana, where is Lana? Lana Abu Hijla, or Bill Browder, who's not with us today because he's in Washington testifying, but I, I couldn't know those two without recognizing that freedom from fear is still elusive in places like Palestine and Russia. And yes, in Fresno too, I think, and in St. Paul, and in Walter's hometown of New Orleans and my own hometown of Baltimore. And yet, in just the past few years, thanks to the hard work of so many, including many of you in this room, it seemed to me that the trend lines of progress were on an upward slope. Headlines, armed conflicts between sovereign states at historic lows. A billion people, 500 million of them in China alone, lifted out of poverty. Online platforms democratizing education around the world. Renewable energy on the rise. Same-sex marriage legalized. And then suddenly, it's as if the sands have shifted. Now, I'm an optimist by nature. I'm convinced that the glass is half full. And I choose to continue to believe that. But I'm more than a little bit confused. And I don't think I'm the only one. And so the timing of this, Linda and Stewart, of the 2017 Resnick Aspen Action Forum could not be better. I believe that the reason why we are more of us than we've ever been for this gathering is that more than a few of us need this moment to just be still, to exhale, and to think. And since Skip Battle always reminds us that reading alone is as bad as drinking alone, It's wonderful that we can be still and think together. Just since we'd last gathered last year and I was up talking to you last year, I've sat with fellows all over the world, which is one of the great privileges of my job. I sat with fellows like Zhang Yuzhang in Beijing to hear about China's really impressive moves with Europe now, not with the US, to curb carbon emissions. But I also heard from other fellows about troubling new political developments in places like Hong Kong. In London, I was traveling with Jennifer Simpson, the managing director of our Finance Leaders Fellowship. I attended a dinner and heard of all sorts of exciting things that our fellows who live in London, people like Sean Hinton and Toby Koppel were up to. But it didn't take too long till the table conversation turned to Brexit and to things like, at that time, the the uh, elections coming up in France, which lots of people were nervous about. In Greenville, South Carolina, with Rima Kahn and, and uh, with Michelle Wilver, we met with our health innovators. And we sat around the table talking about some truly amazing technologies that are out there in the medical field right now. Uh, on the way out here, my wife Denise and my daughter Eva traveled cross country to visit colleges. And we stopped at Washington University in St. Louis, and we visited with a guy named Eric Luthart, who's one of our health innovators. And we saw these incredible things that he's doing. He calls them neuroprosthetics. I'm not smart enough to know what that means, but these are medical devices that respond directly to brain waves. It was amazing to see the sort of work that Eric and many others in our Health Innovators Fellowship are doing. But we also started talking about things like another technology that you've probably heard of called CRISPR a technology that suddenly gives us the ability to tinker with the human genome, with genes and living cells, and according to some,
to control evolution itself. Out at Y River campus, Tonya Hinch, Skip and I sat with our Henry Crown fellows talking about all the mind-boggling accelerations in artificial intelligence, in automation. But we also asked, what does this mean for the factory workers, for the truck drivers, for the mortgage brokers watching their jobs and their futures diminish and maybe even disappear? The very people who turned out in large numbers around the world in elections and referenda in 2016 and 2017. Something is happening. And so we come together for the next four days to talk about the theme of this gathering, the Great Reset. Our goals, as always, to pause, reflect, refresh, and recommit to action. But this year in particular, what I'd like us to be doing is to inventory all the incredible changes in what our closing speaker, Tom Friedman, calls in his new book, which I can't recommend highly enough, The Age of Accelerations, which I think captures so well what we're living through. And I'd like us to be asking ourselves three fundamental questions over the next few days. How do we, as leaders, recalibrate to make sure that all of the tremendous changes going on around us have a net positive impact on society, that we see them as opportunities for enlightened leadership, not threats. How do we do this while remaining true to our core bedrock values? And by the way, what do we, the Aspen Global Leadership Network and all of our invited guests here in the room, how, and we're all lovingly dubbed the intergalactic army of the just, I must remind you, by Ben Dunlop, who, Bernie Dunlop, who's not with us today. But how do we define what we want to be the core bedrock values of the Aspen Global Leadership Network and all of our work together? The Aspen Institute, as you saw in the film, was founded 67 years ago. There were a lot of different threads that led to the creation of what I think is an amazing institution. But two of them have always resonated particularly deeply with me. The first thread was the idea of creating a neutral place, a place for leaders from different backgrounds with different worldviews, people who but for the Aspen Institute probably wouldn't be sitting around a table together, to come together in civil, constructive dialogue to see if they couldn't make some headway in dealing with the most difficult challenges of our times. This gathering, just to state the obvious, is very much in that tradition of bringing together a pretty unlikely group of people, but a group of people for constructive dialogue. Lord knows we have a lot to talk about, whether it's racism or sexism or xenophobia or inequality. Did I mention that an ice shelf twice the size of Luxembourg recently broke off? We do have a lot to talk about. The second thread in our founding was the idea of humanism. This was called, until 1986, I believe, the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies. The idea that, and I'm quoting here Mortimer Adler, one of the founders of the Aspen Institute, where science has a technological or productive utility, philosophy has a moral utility. Philosophy can't tell men how to make things, but it can direct them towards making a good rather than an evil use of them. It directs the conduct of the individual life and of society itself by the moral truths it's able to teach us about justice, liberty, duty, virtue, and happiness. In other words, in the very founding of the Aspen Institute was the idea of asking perhaps one of the most difficult questions we can ask of hard-charging leaders. And that question is, just because we can does that mean we should? At the time of our founding, this question had to do with things like the deployment of atomic energy, had to do with things like the deployment of what were considered miracle chemicals. I saw this amazing uh, special Denise and I were watching about Rachel Carson, of course, the mother of the modern environmental movement, and I was amazed to see that in the 1950s there were television commercials encouraging moms to sprinkle their kids' hair with DDT to keep the bugs away. And so nobody really was asking the questions until the Aspen Institute came along. Just because we can produce these so-called miracle things, does that mean we should deploy them? 
Today, it's a question that seems worth asking about a lot of different things. Just because we can close borders to stem the tide of people, does that mean that we should? Just because we can splice genes and extend life to 150, does that mean it's a good idea and that we should? Just because we can automate all sorts of jobs, does it mean that we should? The list goes on. We're going to ask ourselves these questions and more in the coming days. As we do that, I ask that we do so with humility and with civility. I want to be very, very clear here. There are those in this room and all across the Aspen Global Leadership Network who feel that the world is moving in exactly the wrong direction. There are also people in this room and the Aspen Global Leadership Network who feel that it's moving in the right direction. In between are those who aren't quite sure, but who also can't believe that more of us didn't see the great disruptions that we're now experiencing coming down the tracks, especially since in hindsight, so many of the causes were right there in front of us in plain view. We need to respect all of these viewpoints. As I said to a group this morning, this is called the Great Reset, but this isn't about resetting everybody else. This is about us <laughs> resetting. Your goal here is not to reset everybody else in the room. <laughs> Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, who I mentioned earlier, talked about this in one of his commencement addresses this year. He said, with freedom of speech comes a responsibility to listen. To listen, as we tell every participant at every Aspen seminar, on the very first day of the seminar, we say we need you to listen actively not merely to wait for that space where you can get in and rebut what the other person is saying, but to listen closely and to try to understand not just what the other person is saying, but why they've come to believe that what they're saying is true. Confucius said it best. He said, don't worry so much that others fail to understand you. Worry that you fail to understand others. To those of you here today, feeling some trepidation about sharing your views, lest they be unpopular, let me repeat what we also say at the beginning of every Aspen seminar. If you feel that the tide of conversation is going in a direction that makes you uncomfortable, it's your duty. It's your responsibility to speak up. It's going to be uncomfortable. I do it all the time. I know how uncomfortable it can get. But it's why you're here. It's why you're part of this network, and it's why you're at this gathering. And I know this. In speaking up, you will be a source of learning for others, whether you know it or not. I've mentioned Darren Walker a few times. I want to close this part of my remarks by mentioning him again. He was, as I said, elaborating in a series of speeches on Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms. And he didn't just say, with freedom of speech comes a responsibility to listen. He said, with freedom of belief comes a responsibility to accept one another with empathy, to fight off our reflexive push towards exclusion, and to embrace inclusion. Not to deny or ignore our differences, oh, they're very real, but to recognize and to celebrate them. With freedom from want, he said, comes a responsibility to serve others. Let's be honest, there are very few people in this room who suffer from true want. And if we're humble enough to admit that, I hope we're equally humble enough to accept that it's probably because people in our lives took the initiative to help and to sacrifice for us. So it's up to us to do the same with respect, with care for the true needs and the dignity of others. And as Brian Stevenson admonished us last year up on the stage, in true proximity, not from a sterile distance. Darren's last lesson for us is this. With freedom from fear comes appropriately for us here today the responsibility to act, to oppose those who would spread fear, to defend the vulnerable, to live with integrity and courage and compassion. To avoid becoming comfortably numb, in these our privileged enclaves, lest we become the ones that future generations, like my daughter over there in the action camp, I don't want her to be asking me, where were you when your neighbors needed you? Civility, inclusion, empathy, humility, service, 
integrity, courage, compassion, action. Not the full list of values that I hope prevails in this network, but not such a bad start either. Welcome to the 2017 Resnick Aspen Action Forum. The glass is half full. Abdication is not an option. The world needs courageous, entrepreneurial, optimistic, and perhaps most importantly, joyful leaders who are ready to lean in and, and to act. I think I know where to find at least 2,500 of them. <laughs> so who's here in the room today? This has become a ritual, and I hope we can go through the ritual again. Let's see. We are 375 people from 30 countries gathered in the room today. Just over half of us are women. Just under half are men. <laughs> Most of us are from the private business sector, but many are here from the nonprofit sector and from the world of government. But who exactly are we? I wanted to point out Walter, but I'm not sure Walter's here yet. But Walter's, of course, our fearless CEO, without whom none of what we've been able to accomplish in the last few years would have been possible. He's going to be stopping in, I think, before this is over. Um, but as we know, and as Keith reminded us, when it comes to the AGLN, the Aspen Global Leadership Network, in the beginning, there was the Henry Crown Fellowship Program. So may I ask all of the Henry Crown Fellows, the overseers, the moderators, and staff to please stand and be up there. <laughs> Let me especially recognize Francis Hoffman without he and his wife, Muriel, none of us would be here in the room today. Francis. <laughs> Bill Mayer, Keith Berwick, Skip Battle, the people who built such a strong foundation that this Aspen Global Leadership Network stands on, please stand. And of course, the tireless Tonya Hinch and Martha Lang. I'm delighted that we also have here today representatives of nearly all of our leadership initiatives. So as we do every year, let me ask that the fellows, the managing directors, and the board members of the each, each of them please stand as I call them out. I'm going to read this out in the order of the founding of each of these fellowships. And in the beginning, there was the Africa Leadership Initiatives, West Africa, East Africa, and South Africa. <laughs> The Liberty Fellowships of the Great State of South Carolina. A special thanks to Hain and Anna Kate for being here and for making this all possible. Please stand. Yesterday, I was uh, uh, trying to figure out, so who's going to be here at the lunch? And I was sending out notes to people. And I sent Hain a note. And I said, are you here yet? Are you going to be at lunch tomorrow? And he said, well, we're leaving. We're probably going to get in around 1030 or so. Not sure. Uh, maybe I'll be at the lunch. And I said, well, Hain, I was going to call you out. I mean, I hope you're going to be here. And he said, in that case, we'll move up our flight departure. <laughs> and so sure enough. Uh, but I just want to say, not only would there be no Liberty Fellowship in the great state of South Carolina, which has had such an incredible impact on that state, but the truth be told, there would not be a Health Innovators Fellowship either, because it really was Anna Kate and Hain uh, who talked to the folks at Greenville Health uh, about the great work and the impact uh, that you had seen on the Liberty Fellows of South Carolina. So I want to thank you that as well. Thank you. Hayne, did I forget to congratulate you for anything else? 
Oh, yeah, we're good? Okay, good. He sent me a long list, but I decided to edit it. Um, the Central America Leadership Initiative, always here in great numbers. Always, always our quietest group. We can never get them to participate in any of the social activities. But I want to particularly recognize Claudia Salmeron, our new managing director. And it's great that we have several board members here. We have Stanley Mota, we have Harry Strachan, we have Stace Lindsay. We, I'm not sure if Gigi is here yet. We have Luis Ayala, and I'm not sure if Tom McCloskey is in the room, but may I ask the board members to please stand. I'm going, to back, I'm going to backtrack for one second because I wanted to call out uh, Mikey Johnson, the chairman of the Liberty Fellowship. I wanted to call out the CEO, Luann Rungi, and, and her team who's on site, Anne-Marie Stiritz and Janice Wilkins. Forgive me. <laughs> Next is the Rodell Fellowships in Public Leadership. And the India Leadership Initiative now remain the Kamalnaya Bajaj Fellowship. I hope I got that right. <laughs> the Pahara Aspen Education and Teacher Leaders Fellowships, with special thanks to Adria Goodson and Samra Mercurio Grio. Please stand. The Caddo Environmental Fellowship Program, which we hope to revive, is the Aspen Environment Leaders Fellowship, with special thanks to Christo Haling, who's working on that for us. Please stand. <laughs> the Middle East Leadership Initiative, and I want to welcome our newly minted Managing Director, Tim El Hadi, and I want to point out the founder of the Middle East Leadership Initiative, Shadi Al Muyushi. You might have heard a noise over there when I talked about anything that had to do with China. Next is the China Fellowship Program with our new managing director, Spring Fu. The U.S. Health Innovators Fellowship, ably led by Rima Cohen, and we have board members Michelle Wilver and board member Paul Anderson in the room. And last but not least, the Finance Leaders Fellowship, led by Jennifer Simpson, with co-chairs Ranji Nagaswamy, Chris Varelis, and board member Bill Mayer. Please stand. <laughs> Who else are we? Well, we have 76 young adults from 15 countries at this year's Action Forum Youth Camp. Some of, this are some of those are going to be joining us for a series of intergenerational dialogues later in the week. And I should point out that their readings mirror those that everybody else is using. So uh, if the kids seem a little grumpy, we all know why. But uh, everybody, everybody has looked me in the eye and sworn that they really enjoyed the readings. So please welcome them. We have our Resnick Leadership Fellows from the Central Valley of California with great thanks to Emily for bringing them all together. We have our colleagues here from the Skoll Foundation, including 10 tremendous, outstanding social entrepreneurs. And we have an array of representatives from a whole number of Aspen Institute programs, from Ascend to First Movers to the Urban Innovation Lab, Aspen Spain, our education program, the Forum on Community Solutions, our financial security program. Everyone from the Aspen Institute, other programs, please stand and be recognized.
In the room with us today, some of the most important people, because let me be clear, inspiring and moving people to action, to nudge them, to think much more deeply is the hard work of our moderator core. We have an amazing moderator core. Uh, and I'd like to ask all of our moderators and moderators in training to please stand and be recognized. That, include, that includes you, Bill Mayer. <laughs> I want to especially thank Stace Lindsay, who's been so ably leading the moderator court. And Paul Anderson as well, because it was Paul and Mary who decided about 10 years to make the investment in building out this moderator court. Little did we know how valuable that was going to be. Paul, for your foresight, thank you so much. Margot Pritzker, we've already recognized you as the chair of the Leadership Committee and, and longtime supporter of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, but I don't think I saw you stand up at any point. <laughs> Anne McNulty and her family, creators of the John P. McNulty Prize, along with Prilage, who manages the prize. On behalf of the family, alongside Nina Sonny, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Rick Braddock, who I made sure didn't drive into the lake today, for your support of the Braddock Scholars Program. Thank you so much. I had a chance to attend those, those conversations yesterday. Bill was in the room along with many of our trustees serving as mentors. This is a program that's been created for our fellows whose ventures have reached the point where they're ready to go to scale. Rick, you too had the foresight to bring this to our attention and I want to thank you for your support for the Braddock Scholars Program. We're opening up to the next class of scholars. If anyone has an interest in this, please stop by the Action Lab outside the door and talk to Alexis. Alexis, are you here? Uh, but you, there she is, Alexis Edinger. And so please speak with her if you'd like to sign up. I have a number of senior colleagues here, I think. Elliot Gerson is here, Raj Vinokota, of course, because he's a fellow, Dr. Eric Motley, who does so well on the screen, I think. Don't you agree? <laughs> uh, but does so well everywhere. Jim Spiegelman, um, please stand and be recognized if you're here in the room. <laughs> my amazing wife, Denise. My amazing daughter, Eva. The incredible Aspen Global Leadership Network team, many of whom have been working on this since, I think, August 2nd last year. Please stand and be recognized. There they are. And the man uh, himself, uh, without whom I wouldn't be standing here, and that is Tom Loper. Where is Tom Loper? Just one more thing, and then I'm going to get off the stage and join you all for the first of our plenary events. Aspen is a, a pretty magical place. It always amazes me, and you never know who you're going to bump into who happens to be coming into town. It is our very great fortune that U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg will be in town, and thanks to Dr. Eric Motley, has agreed to address us at lunch on Sunday at 1 p.m. Really quite a privilege. And with that, let's begin with a panel discussion appropriately named The Great Reset. Uh, this will be moderated by a young woman who uh, was up very late last night. Um, CNN national correspondent, Henry Crown Fellow, Suzanne Malveaux, has been covering the White House, of course, for years and has moved on uh, to cover uh, Congress. And so uh, she was up late last night watch watching some pretty remarkable machinations in the U.S. Congress. But Suzanne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to give a special shout out to my 21 lassos out there. 
to our class, Henry Crown Fellows. Um, as what you might uh, hear, hopefully she won't speak up too much. She doesn't have an action pledge, but my family's here, my three-year-old daughter. Maybe she's the youngest one who's here, but hopefully, uh, you know, she won't be too loud and, and rambunctious about it. Um, this is really an incredible uh, opportunity, of course, because when Peter invited me, I wasn't sure I was going to have the time to, to even take uh, with this, but uh, it seems like every day is a reset every hour, so it's, uh, I, I welcome this extraordinary group of panelists that, that are going to be a part of this uh, this afternoon because it really does give us a chance to look at the big picture. Um, so without further ado, let me go ahead and call them up here uh, one by one and introduce them and we'll get started. I will do about uh, maybe 20 minutes, a little conversation here, and then open it up to the audience and hopefully we'll be able to get as many questions in as possible from you guys. Um, Dr. Wayne uh, Franklin, Health Innovators uh, Fellowship Program, second class called uh, Too Legit to Quit. Uh, come on up. Uh, rock star surgeon, professor, director, and founder of the uh, Texas Adult uh, Congenital Heart Program. So come on up, Wayne. All right, next we got uh, Jocelyn Mangan. She is the uh, Henry Crown Fellow of the class uh, uh, 2016 straight out of Aspen class, uh, is what they call themselves. A COO of uh, Snag a Job, and we'll talk about that. And also name one of 100 most creative people in business. Welcome, Jocelyn. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Carlo Viviani. He is of the uh, the Cato. I've learned uh, class second nature. It's called. He's a senior economist for. Greece at the European Commission in Brussels, obviously uh, also previously held a key position in the At Italian Prime Minister's office. Welcome, Carlo. Um, so Jayan, uh, he also with the uh, Cato Second Nature class, uh, current CEO of Conservation International, uh, known throughout the world uh, for his work as a global conservation scientist. Uh, also, in my world, does a lot of TV, so welcome. Appreciate all you here. All right, let's get started. Let's start off with Wayne. Okay. Uh, Wayne, you and I probably both were up late last night. Uh, we we saw maybe maybe you were what I assume you were, you were watching the uh, there was the something development. on TV there was yeah. something on yeah. TV going yeah. on. <laughs> um, let's open up. Let's talk about that because um, it was pretty extraordinary what we did see. Uh, we sent a, we saw Senator John McCain uh, cast the vote, the deciding vote, defying his own party, uh, the former rival, of course, of uh, President Barack Obama, and uh, in support, you could say, of. Obama's signature health care initiative, his legislative initiative. Uh, when we watched that, it seemed like there was a reset of sorts that was going on last night. Can you tell us, politics aside, um, what do you make of what we saw? And what do you make of really the larger debate that's happening now about who is responsible for taking care and making sure there is good health care for everyone in this country? Well, that's a tough question, and that's one that's hard to actually separate out politics. And um, to quote Donald Trump, and I'm not going to quote Trump on too many things, but healthcare is challenging. Healthcare is difficult. <laughs> uh, pretty basic, but it, and that'll be my last Trump quote, I promise. Um, but it's it's really tough. One, one thing that I've noticed as a physician who's been in practice for several years is that there's not a lot of doctors making these decisions. You know. And it's not all about doctors, that's for sure, but we're the, a lot of times the, the providers of the care and, and the ones that are sort of in the, in the sort of the limelight or the crosshairs, you could say it that way. What I think happened last night was a very important um, statement that the, that the Congress made about not wanting to, to touch Obamacare. And I'll just tell you, Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act, it's the same thing. A lot, of parent, a lot of people didn't know that, as you know. It's the same thing. Uh, and I'm actually serious about that. But it is... Um, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's, it's actually a, a move that President Obama and the Congress made years ago to say, how can we try to fix this? You know, because there's lots of problems with healthcare, and I think that was a good first start. So to answer your question, what was last night about? I think it was showing the, 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 the government, is showing society that I think people are 
okay with how it is now. It could certainly get better, but they don't want to revamp it, and they don't want to revamp it without a plan, that's for sure. And to the larger point, do you think that when you look at societies around the world and the approach that it, they take to healthcare, is in your field the, the question about a right to health care uh, an important one, one that you deal with? Well, it is. I deal with a lot of patients who are uninsured. I come from Texas. We have the highest rate of uninsured patients in the country. It's 25 percent of all of Texas. So that's a problem. And it leads to lots of other health care problems and financial problems. But I think one of the ways we need to do it is to have a, a government-funded option. I'll just go out there and say that, because we have to have some ways as a safety net for some people. We have a lot of people in this country who think health care is more of a privilege. Uh, I don't personally agree with that. I think it's more of a right that people should have it. But I know a lot of people think there's going to be uh, problems meeting that common ground. But I do think that we have to offer some government or federal uh, way to take care of people. Jocelyn, I want to talk about really how the economy and the way people work seems to be evolving as well. In your field, you are CEO of Snag a Job. I want you to explain this idea of the gig economy and what that means for what, 80 million people in our country who work on an hourly basis. Sure, so we work with hourly workers and employers, and one of the things we find is the number one thing they want is flexibility. So it's not a surprise they get their schedules less than a week in advance. Um, they're striving for work-life balance. Um, many of them want more hours than they get. So, you know, we talk about unemployment being low, but un underemployment's high. So 70% of our, the hourly workers that we've surveyed are living paycheck to paycheck or in debt. So what the gig economy offers them is that flexibility, right? That ability to kind of gain back control of their schedule. Um, it also allows them to maybe earn a living wage, right? To fill in those gaps. Um, that said, I think it ties into what we're talking about, the safety net. You know, the, the problem with the gig economy is that we're not really prepared for it in terms of health insurance, um, in terms of some of the benefits, 401k savings, that these people also will need. So I think those are some of the big questions that the emergence of this, we're going to have to answer. And when you think about values, your own values, or even collective values, are there threats to those values because of the way people are now having to work from job to job, whether or not it is a safety net or taking care of our children, protecting, yeah, our, you know, taking care of our, our elderly parents. T talk about some of the, the, the impacts, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, when you talk to them and you find out, you know, they're not actually talking about minimum wage and health care as much as they're talking about work-life balance, about flexibility. I mean, these are basic privileges that we should have. We should be able to call in sick to our jobs because we have a, a sick toddler at home and not worry about getting fired. Um, we should be able to, you know, live a fulfilling life um, with the weight if we're working 35, 40 hours a week. And so, you know, even with the current minimum wage, it's, it's not quite making it for many, many of these people. So I think the basic values of I work hard and therefore I can you know, pay my bills and I can come home and spend time with my children, those are all, you know, under threat. Carlo, you, you, you deal with the big picture, you deal with the world stage and clearly involved in looking at first the, the financial collapse, the debt uh, involving Greece and then uh, Europe as a whole as we saw with Brexit and these uh, movements throughout the world, these nationalistic type of movements, populism if you will. What, what's going on? Tell us in your world, what is happening here? I mean, what is the greatest challenge that, that you see in, in terms of mass movement? Well, look, I, I think that the, the basic gist of the problem is lack of leadership uh, at the political level. Leadership. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the essence is that the world has changed. I mean, we all know that. Uh, this creates basic concerns for many people who maybe have uh, temporary jobs, Maybe they don't have access to health care. Maybe they feel their identity threatened because they see many people from other countries coming in their country. And uh, there is no actual uh, response from, uh, from, uh, from politicians to that. Politicians tend to follow the basic uh, instincts, if I can say that, of people rather than leading them towards solutions and addressing the root causes of those problems. This does, just doesn't happen. Uh, if you look at Brexit, which is a 
classic example of that, there are hundreds of problems and hundreds of reasons why Brexit happened. I mean, one can think about the basic uh, British culture and uh, their, their kind of attitude towards Europe historically has always been uh, of a certain kind, uh, especially if you look at one famous episode of Yes Minister, which I would invite you to look at. Uh, but uh, I would say the Brexit was born because of fear of immigration from Europe, essentially, okay? Britain is part of Europe. One of the fundamental freedoms that we have in Europe is freedom of movement. So once you're in any European country, you can go anywhere you want without any limit. And this was uh, a problem of fear for many British people who, feel, who felt threatened by that. So uh, what was the response of the government? Well, there was no response. Actually, they called the referendum. So maybe we can get out of it. And then they had somehow campaigned against the referendum itself. So I, I wouldn't call, I mean, I'm speaking on a personal capacity. I'm, I'm, I work for an institution, so I'm not supposed to, uh, to delve into politics, of course. Uh, but on a personal capacity, to me, that sounds like a tremendous lack of leadership. And the, uh, the, the bigger um, issue, when you take a look at migration and the fear around it, Clearly, uh, what's happening is this refugee crisis yes. that is created by the Syrian war. We've seen that uh, manifest itself throughout the Middle East as well as Europe. Yes. Is there a, uh, a common ground or a bridge in which you have those who literally have been displaced from their homes and those who feel displaced who are, are taking in refugees? Uh, wh where is that? Where is that point of an understanding? Look, there's a lot of confusion around this. I mean, I come from a country which uh, saw a fundamental transformation um, in this regard. I mean, in Italy in 1980, you had 180,000 foreign people in the country, in the whole country. We're a country of about 55 to 60 million people, okay? Right now, uh, we have 5.4 million foreigners in the country. Uh, none of them is a refugee. Let's be very clear about them. One quarter of them comes from Romania because uh, there is freedom of movement in the European Union. So you have people from Romania, you have economic migrants that come from Morocco, which is the second largest group in Italy. Then you have people from Albania and so on. Uh, if you look at refugees, that's another story. If you look at the database from United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, you see that uh, the largest number of refugees in Italy this year, we have had 100,000 of them until now, comes from Nigeria, 22% of them. So there is no one coming from Syria, actually. Uh, the, the, uh, but migration is not a problem per se. The, the, uh, to me, migration is the byproduct of globalization, is the byproduct of wars elsewhere. So again, if you don't tackle the basic problem of, of globalization, you will have the, the, the influx of migration and you will have fear from people. So unless you understand as a politician that uh, people feel threatened in their identity from migrants, and so you have to do something about that to rebuild a sort of national identity which is more inclusive, perhaps. Unless you do that, well, you will fail inevitably and populism will prevail. So Jane, I want to talk a little bit about your area as well. Uh, Peter had mentioned the fact that you, you just recently you have this report of this piece of ice that's breaking off that's the size of Delaware. We know that, um, that the climate and temperature is at uh, record highs. And, and yet, um, the discussion around it, there, there, se there seems to be uh, those who are, are still rejecting the notion and those who are pushing forward. Uh, we saw very recently the US rejection of the Paris Climate Accord. We thought that perhaps other leaders would follow. That did not happen at the G20 summit. We saw new alliances. So explain to us who's, who's leading? Uh, where, where's the big reset in that in space? Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you, everyone, for having, uh, having me here. Um, you know, Peter talked about uh, Bob Dylan. So let me just say that you know, I grew up in Africa. Uh, I'm from South Asia originally, and I came to America because of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> because a kid, Perfect. I've never been to America before. This is relevant to this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
a kid who um, is half Lebanese, half Brazilian, who now lives in Saudi Arabia, gave me the album Nebraska. <laughs> and there's something about that cover that gave me the sense of endless possibility. In fact, the last song on that album is called Reason to Believe. And I always believed that for the 25 years or so I've lived here. I always have thought that the society we live in here gives you endless possibility and reasons to believe. There is, in the depth of my heart, some doubt creeping in now. You know, what you saw, let me just sort of lay out what I think are the three or four big challenges for this environmental community. When, when we pulled out of Paris, when we mean the US government pulled out of Paris, what it did do is it aligned 900 companies with the environmental community and 100 plus nations. That was amazing. That is an incredible, incredible opportunity. We've always seen the environmental movement versus big business has been this divide. That divide is fundamentally gone now. So for me, I see this moment as an incredible moment of opportunity for leadership. And I truly believe that leadership will come fastest from business, not from the environmental sector per se. We've sort of done our thing. I mean, we've, we've screamed from the top of the mountain as hard as we could, and we've only got so far. But businesses can do it more. If you look at what we can do, obviously clean energy and all of that, that's already happening, big transformation happening there. The big play, I truly believe, is in tropical forests. So about 30% of the emissions reduction and capture that we need to meet the Paris goals has to come from emission reduction and capturing tropical forests. It cannot come any other way. Yet only 2% of the funding goes there. So when Fiji Water funds Sovi Basin rainforest or Disney funds the Altamayo project in Peru, that's what they're basically doing. They're capturing carbon in terms of forests. I think the big other challenge that's out there today that very few people are talking about is there is a very large pot of money, somewhere between seven to $10 billion, looking for green investments and not finding them. There's more money out there looking for restoration projects, for land uh, degradation projects, for fisheries projects, and not finding them. And if we can unlock that capital by de-risking those projects, that money will flow. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm generally fairly optimistic. I've always found that the way this country leads has been positive and powerful. But it, it, within, within amongst a group of friends, you know, there is some fear in my heart. Because we're in such uncharted times, not only politically, but also technologically. The technological revolution that's happening today, you know, you talked about AI. We don't really understand it. We, it took us 100,000 years to get used to fire <laughs> or to figure out that the wheel could do something, right? Today, the speed of technology has completely outpaced evolution. It's completely outpaced biology. And Tom talks about that, right? Tom says, Friedman says, look, you've got the minds uh, and the emotions of Neanderthals by the power of gods. <laughs> and I don't know where that takes us down the road. So, this is the moment to be in this debate. You know, we're the first generation in human history who can see the future, genuinely can predict the planet's temperature. Genuinely. Think about how amazing that is. Can predict how much fish there is, how much forest there is, how much carbon there is, how much water there is. We know the future. We have the technology to get it done. We terribly lack the leadership. I'm glad you brought up technology, artificial intelligence. Uh, Wayne and I are both wearing these eye watches. Uh, his is working, mine is not. Uh, <laughs> we got to fix that. But that's been a real uh, incredible development that we've seen recently when you talk about uh, smartphones and all kinds of other smart things involved in our health and giving us an incredible amount of data about how we're doing. And some people predict perhaps there'll be a a smart fridge, right, that'll know exactly what you're eating, how many calories, um, smart floors, smart everything. So to tell, tell us a little bit about whether or not that really, you think, makes a difference, if there's an impact the, when we see this technology developing so quickly and our own behavior. Well, I think the technology is amazing. And me as a physician, I want to harness and use that technology. But I think we have to know how to use it. There's, there's so much information out there. If you just take 
Fitbits, right? Everybody years ago had a Fitbit, generates a lot of information. It's now tra translated to smartwatches, smartphones, smart cars. But how do we use that technology and how we use those data and really make meaningful outcomes? You know, we, we have technology now that can tell you what your heart rate is every hour of the day, how much sleep you get, uh, what time you roll over in bed at night, how much you weigh when you step on your rug in the morning. Your rug might have a scale in it. There's pacemakers that we put in that can talk to the physician without even the patient knowing it. So part of it is, I think, the, the privacy issue, but part of it is how do we harness that technology. There was an article that came out a few years ago looking at Twitter and the impact of social media. And I see that that's very important, but it basically said that if you look at Twitter, Twitter is just as predictive as the CDC for predicting heart disease. Well, how really? is that, right? Mm -hmm. It's because they looked at things like how many people used aggressive words, four-letter words, used, uh, you know, hashtag whatever, right? And that was just as, as predictive as, say, the CDC predicting heart attacks in the Northeast. So that shows you the power of social media and, and wearable technology, but we have to know what to do with it. And I think we're, we're at the, with the time now, we have this great gift but we still need to harness that and use it for health, uh, Im impactful and healthful information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jocelyn, talk about the, the, uh, the automation of jobs because there are so many people who are looking at their future and, and looking that perhaps their own job uh, will no longer exist by the time they're ready to retire. And so there is that, that gap. Yeah, so we, um, we're mostly exposed to restaurant, retail, and hospitality, and there's definitely repetitive tasks in those industries, like you've read about at the Amazon store and you know, Chipotle drones and stuff like that. In fact, our executive team went to McDonald's the other day to experience the kiosk, um, but the irony was that we go to the kiosk and you know, we're getting frustrated because one of them's broken and the payment doesn't work. <laughs> Long story short, we get through the kiosk, and then this nice woman comes over, and we're in McDonald's, and brings us our food, right? And, and it just is a reminder that like, it isn't just about the technology, and especially in these service industries, like, it's about how it makes us feel. And so what we find is that, yes, jobs are getting automated, repetitive tasks are getting automated, but I also um, firmly believe, and we're seeing it, that in order to match people to these roles, whether it's a waitress or a cashier, anything kind of front of house or service oriented, people have to have social skills. You know, we spend a lot of time in algorithms matching people, their location and, and all these data points. The one data point that's really hard is this what we, we kind of are, are trying to call the hospitality quotient. Um, that's really still hard to kind of get right um, through, through data. And I think, you know, I think it's gonna be hard to automate. So, I'd say that, and then I'd say in the spirit of the glass being half full, I think it's also really important for us to start measuring the right things. So I read an article the other day, and it's talking about in a certain city, you know, only certain, this number of people work for Amazon, but they left out all the people in the warehouses. Right? Those are hourly jobs, and sometimes they're high paying hourly jobs. So I think some of it is just, you know, I, I don't know that we know the answer yet, but I want to also make sure we're measuring the right things, because I think automation is killing some, and it's opening up other doors. Um, and then I think for, for the young people and, and the young people here and around, it's making sure that they are prepared early for all these changes, that we're studying them enough to be sending them in the right direction. And Carla, you, you've seen, when we talk about immigration and the populations moving, I, I mean, there definitely has been uh, the trend for, as we see, folks are not coming into this country, the United States. Some are fearful for leaving, for the fear that they will not return. I mean, clearly this relates to how people work, how they live, yeah. and some of that fear you talked about. Yeah, well, the, it, as I was saying before, in Italy we've had a huge growth uh, in migration. This has uh, um, indeed taken up a number of jobs, which essentially Italians didn't want to make anymore. Uh, one example, which is a bit unknown perhaps, is that you have a large Indian community uh, in Italy, uh, in the center south of Italy, which work uh, attending uh, um, uh, in, on dairy, on, in the dairy industry, uh, because they're very good with cows, essentially, and with buffaloes. Uh, so uh, they were somehow, uh, they, they came in, they were very well accepted, they, are, they have no problem whatsoever in terms of integration. And uh, I mean, I, I realized that one day because I was on the beach in the south of Italy, and all of a sudden I have 15 Indian guys coming on the beach. I said, it was very odd. 
for me to, to see because, I mean, it's, it's not common to see this kind of people. We see the same thing when we see Italians walking this of way. Course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. I'm pretty sure about that. No, but it, was, uh, it was odd for me. It was, this was already 10 years ago, huh? not, not now. Already 10 years ago, they, 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 and they explained to me this, this movement that had happened and that has been consolidating them. So what I'm saying is that you can have, migra I mean, migration is not a problem per se. As long as you're able to integrate the people, it's not true that people that come with migration steal jobs because, simply say, there are jobs which Italians don't want to make anymore, and I'm sure this happens also uh, in, in any other country. And so they, but there is a need for that kind of job. So uh, the, the, there is a, a big issue with, the, uh, with old people in Italy because the, 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 the care for, for the elders is not very good in terms of uh, broad uh, network of assistance. So you have a large number of people who come from Moldova, for example, or from Romania, who uh, live with old people and, and care for them uh, on behalf of their children or, or their families. So this is kind, these are kinds of jobs which have been developing a lot in Italy and which demonstrate how you can somehow find a good way of integration. Uh, but I mean, when you have 10% of the population almost which is from a foreign country in a country which has always had emigration as a phenomenon, well, that's becoming a bit hard and you're seeing the fear that is becoming to spread. Then you see people coming on boats uh, by the way, uh, as I said, 100,000 people landed in Sicily or in, in the south of Italy uh, as refugees in the first six months of this year. This creates fear because you see all these people, where will they go? What, what will they do? We're invaded, which is complete nonsense, of course. I'm going to ask uh, one quick question uh, from Sajay, and then we'll open it up for questions of the audience and make sure you, we, we have that time. Um, it, a lot of people don't pay attention to this, and um, this is clearly your area where you look at uh, places like national parks, protected areas, things uh, where the landscape and uh, the wildlife are protected. And you've done amazing studies that have uh, won numerous awards uh, looking at the, the change in commitment. And I just want you to address that, if you will, like what is taking place around the world. Yeah, so there's a really in disturbing trend happening on the planet right now. Um, big studies that have been done on terrestrial parks and marine parks show that there is a little bit of a movement towards degazetting them. Like basically, you know, what the debate we're having right now about the monuments uh, like Bears Ear. Degazette. Uh, degazette. So basically uh, bringing them down in status from a fully protected area. Or the Papahana Umuakuakea National Park in um, National Monument in Hawaii that is right now under the crosshairs of the, of the Interior Department in terms of maybe potentially bringing, uh, lowering its level of protection. That is a bit of a trend that you're seeing. You're seeing it in Africa, you're seeing it in Asia. Um, it's a worrying trend and also the money to actually manage these protected areas. It's not terribly clear exactly why. I mean, I, my, my own thing, you know, my belief is that the reason this is happening is that we have done we meaning the environmental community, has d have done a really bad job about communicating why these actually matter to the livelihoods of people. At the end of the day, most people want to live a little bit of a better life than their parents did. They want security. They want the opportunities to send their kids to school. They want health care. You know, they just want a little bit. They don't actually even want it. They want the opportunity to have it sometime in the near future. And we know, we know we've done these studies where protected areas add tremendously to the economy of a region. I live part-time in Montana. Yellowstone National Park, 25 years ago, you never went there in the winter, really, unless you snowmobile. Today, there is an entire industry in Yellowstone in the winter because it's the best time to see wolves. I mean, it's a $40 million industry for quite small communities to have. We haven't done that good job of connecting that at the end of the day, people need nature to thrive, that there's an economic connection between people's livelihoods and conservation. All right, thanks. Let's open it up. Who's, who'd like to? We've got microphones on both sides or on just on this side right now? Both sides. Oh, OK. Uh, feel free. Anybody who wants to uh, go first? <laughs> We've got one in the middle there, please. Table 14. 
So, Jan, you mentioned the uh, the initiative of these over 100 companies in the U.S. That 900 companies. 900, excellent. So, you mentioned this corporate initiative in the U.S. that are trying that are basically pledging to um, meet the requirements that the U.S. government would have met, um, and actually uh, fund the U.S. government's funding as well. Could you could you talk about what that means for? Um, a change in the in the dialogue, both in the U.S. in terms of sectoral environment, and do you see implications beyond the U.S. in terms of um, corporate uh, corporate responsibility coming to uh, into an international uh, uh, agreement or an international dialogue? Sure, um, I'm not an expert in the sector by any means, um, so I'll just start by saying that. Paris was fundamentally different from the other climate conferences that we had attended. When we were in Paris, there was a real atmosphere of collaboration, partly because of the horrific attacks Paris had suffered just weeks before. But one of the unique things that happened in Paris was that business was there. They were sort of front and center, and you saw industry leaders, um, board members, chairs of boards there on panels, kind of helping to lead that dialogue. So the stage was being set that it, business clearly had a role to play. What surprised, I, I truly surprised me is that when, when, when um, there, was a, there was a big cry from a lot of companies to stay in Paris. Um, there was ads, front, full page ads in the New York Times from a real disparate group of companies that you would never put Tiffany's with Walmart. I mean, you just had this full spectrum all sort of saying that we need to stay in it. And then when it wasn't going to happen, sort of the hashtag was sort of we're in. You know, we're in it still, right? And it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen. Now we have nine states also joining that coalition where these states are taking a leadership role on doing it. What you don't have is the funding. That's a little bit different. There is some commitment that the US government was hoping to make to uh, a pot of money, for example, the Green Climate Fund that would go, it's not clear whether that will happen. It certainly won't happen under the current, current uh, atmosphere. But what is exciting is seeing companies taking a leadership. I don't know what it'll all amount to. I don't know who will emerge as the leaders. I think it's still too new. But, it, but it's real, and every company now that we're speaking to wants to put this front and center of their agenda. They're no longer doing it quietly. They're now doing it publicly and out in front. And this is from oil companies to consumer goods to clearly environmental companies like Patagonia. All right. They're all there. Someone else? On this side? Uh, this is a question also for the environmental sector because uh, this is also a sector where I, I work. My name is Tao Zhang. I'm a <coughs> uh, Class 3 uh, China Fellowship Program. So um, uh, I guess with the uh, U.S. withdrawal from the uh, Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement and under the new circumstances, China is uh, kind of being put into... Uh, uh, into the uh, to play a, a larger leadership role in the environmental sector, so to speak. So, uh, what suggestions you may have for uh, the private sector in China, or well, probably uh, some suggestions for the Chinese government as things move forward? I know Conservation International has an office in China. Thank you. That's a big question, and it's got to be carefully thought through. Um, mm -hmm. You know. I've been surprised at the rapid pace of change of the Chinese government when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, the most recent discussion we've had have always surprised us at the level at which they are willing to go forward, even in terms of cutting down on coal-fired power plants, renewable technologies, but even take elephants in the ban on ivory. That happened far quicker than any environmental group in Africa thought it would happen. Uh, China basically shutting down its you know, production uh, capabilities for, for ivory and the price immediately dropped. Um, Chinese companies, I think, are starting to find their own way forward. I know that a company, for example, like Alibaba is very interested in thinking about carbon offsets. Um, I've had that dialogue with folks within that company. Uh, there was a recent announcement that you might have heard from Jack Ma in Rwanda, um, pledging something like $1.5 billion to environmental issues in Africa. 
over the next decade or so through the Paradise Foundation. So you are seeing Chinese companies and the leaders of those companies taking a stand and, and making their voice heard. What I'm not clear about is how much they are willing to do within China as opposed to outside of China. Anyone else? Yes, in the middle. Good afternoon. I'm curious <clears throat> about the ways in which we seem to be entering a transition phase in the balance of power um, of the global world order uh, among the, the major countries of the world and the ways in which that represents a, a, a dangerous time in which forces can be unleashed um, unintentionally to lead us into conflict. And I think my question is, do we still live in a world where it's a, a king of the hill power structure, or is there a vision for a multipolar power structure that is stable? Wow, who wants to take that one on? <laughs> well, uh, well, I'm not sure I'm qualified for replying to that, but uh, I mean, I, I, while, while Sanjay was speaking, I, I was thinking of something which perhaps in part replies to your question. I mean. The US is withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Is that really a problem for the world? I mean, Maybe not. I mean, it, of course, it's a wasted opportunity. This we all agree. But uh, if there is a genuine, I mean, uh, how many countries signed? 190 countries, essentially all the countries in the UN organization signed up for it. So uh, if this is the case and everybody respects its own commitments, which is not a given, of course, is it really a problem if, uh, if the US pulls out? Then, so in this sense, I think we are moving a bit more towards a, a multipolar world than, than we were before. I mean, in a sense, we come from a system where uh, we were accustomed in, during the Cold War, the, 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 the just a position of two blocks, okay, that ended in 89. And for a large period of time, we had the sort of prevalence of the US in terms of, of leadership. Uh, this is waning out a bit, not only because the US is changing attitude. It's not just, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't blame the US for that. It's also because other countries like China are taking up more responsibilities in many fields, not just in the environmental or energy field. So I think, yes, we're moving a bit more towards that. In this sense, I would say, uh, well, working for the European Commission, I have to do a bit of uh, a publicity stunt. But uh, <laughs> I would say uh, I work for an organization that uh, somehow coordinates the policy of 500 million people, which is not exactly a small feat. And uh, yes, of course, we have our differences, and uh, we have some, some time our problems. But it's working. We've had the longest period of peace in the history of Europe in the past 500 years, which I think is no small feat. And uh, just if I could add from, from my perch, uh, I mean, it seems like there's definitely uh, a major shift in terms of alliances. And what we see, certainly with trade agreements when it comes to the United States and this current president, is that he is going to be dealing with uh, leaders, whether it's with Mexico or Canada, on a one-to-one -one basis, that you see some of the traditional um, trade alliances that have been disrupted, the uh, climate agreement also disrupted, that there's going to, what we saw in the G20 summit is that literally those leaders doing sidebar meetings with each other to figure that very thing out. How is this going to play out in our own self-interest, our own country's interest? How do we realign so that we get what we want done? So I think that that's definitely going to be an open question uh, in, under this administration. I'm, I'm being told we're, we've run out of time. <laughs> uh, th I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists. It's just an incredible group. Thank, thank, thank you very Thank you very much. Um, Tamsin Smith, she's also a Henry Crown Fellow, an amazing poet, is going to uh, wrap this up for us with her own reading if she would come to the stage after we leave. Thank you so much.
Hi. Thank you. Let's uh, start this off together. Big breath in. OK. How is it that you live, and what is it you do? The tree is a sponge, the earth a sponge, and what are we? With skin porous like bark, lungs that breathe as coral reef, shall we be babes in the bath, freed by the loosening grace of water, lushening our terraced hearts to hanging gardens, We'd see all surface stippled with countless iridescent worlds, lift each glinting bubble of maybe to eye level and blow it forward with a wish. Or let's be gypsies in formation, wind our serpentine shadows across the spiny ground, blend with the borderless caravan of stars, never heading their way nor ours, so by wagon wheel, we'd spin the agate eye of destiny upon the backward-facing view, imagining the dust of our thoughts rearrange the sky. There is value in the waiting place where ideas get space, but by the by, make no mistake, there is no peace in escape. For fate is the shell we carry on our backs its weight is reckoned by the life we grow. The choice is ours, to despair our lot or gloat in gain or fame. But what of this? We could persist, like the leech gatherer on the lonely moor, though old and poor, not declaiming talent nor luck, just gathering what is essential releasing what is not. Each day, not an end, but an outset, a call to press on and keep pressing, beyond pause or applause. For we make what we are when we don't just take what we're given, but create what we give. Each day, not an end, but an outset, a reset breath, so you may be persistent with your art, your instrument, your invention, your hands and your heart, your mind and your voice. It is never too late, for I loved that fifth symphony, but ah, bright wings, what of the ninth? Tireless and tested, scared, even deaf, we reset greatness to make sense beyond sound, permeable, Trude, recenter re your colony, re enter yourself, ring out, fill up, don't quit. The tree is a sponge, the earth a sponge, and you, how is it you live? What is it you do? We're going to pass out copies as you leave. I hope you take one. That concludes this afternoon's program. Uh, the seminar will begin at 2.30. Please disregard the text that you got about 2.15. We will begin at 2.30, the seminars. Thanks so much.